New Testament church sort of taking off. And in, here in chapter 6, look at verse number 8. It says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now look there, I want to focus on these words here where it says, full of faith and power. And what I want to talk about today is how to have a powerful Christian life. How to be a powerful Christian. How to have the power of God on your life. And look, how to be a disciple. Some of the, the things we're going to talk about this morning are, are very basic. It's like, a, like meat and potatoes, right? It's something for everyone. But a lot of Christians, even experienced Christians, have omitted certain points. They are not growing in certain areas. And we're going to cover some first steps for a brand new believer, for a baby Christian. We're also, these same steps also apply to an experienced Christian. You may say, well, I've been saved for many years, but I'm just not experiencing the power of God on my life. Or maybe I don't have the growth that I think that I ought to, to have. Listen, this sermon is for everybody. This is how to be a disciple. How to have God's power on your life. And, and there's this checklist that if you'll take notes about what we're talking about this morning and apply it to your life, it will help you achieve great power in your Christian life. You know, I'm already mature. You know, hey, I already got these things. Hey, pay attention. You may be able to share these things with somebody else and help them learn to grow as a Christian. You know, because listen, th these principles we're going to talk about today will help you build a great foundation that you can build upon. And like I said, it's a checklist. You can also make sure that, you know, you're not missing pieces of the puzzle in your life. You may say, I, I feel like there's something not quite right or I'm not quite where I ought to be as long as I have been saved, well, maybe there's an element that we're going to talk about that's, that's just missing. So these five basic points we'll talk about this morning, if you will follow them, you will succeed. I promise you, you will succeed in your Christian life. And listen, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a computer guy, and you know, there's commands for programming. All right? you, when you want a computer to do something, you send it a command, and that's what the Word of God is. The things we're going to look at this morning are not suggestions. They are commandments of God. I want you to keep this in your mind. That, that, that maybe there's something and you say, well, that's very simple. Well, maybe it's the simple things you need to be faithful in first before you can experience great success. So, you know, these of the five questions we're going to ask you this morning, the first one, the, the foundation we have to make sure of first is what is biblical salvation? Because believe it or not, there are actually unsaved Christians. There are people that would say, well, no, I'm a Christian. I, I believe in God, but yet they actually are not a biblical Christian. There are certain things that are missing that, from their faith. And if you just take one step back to verse number 7, look at Acts chapter 6, verse number 7. It says, And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. The first point is that to be a Christian, you have to be obedient to the faith. What this is saying is not that it's works to get to heaven, but rather it is faith alone. I want you to turn ahead to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. There are two words I want you to remember when it comes to what is a biblical Christian, and that is everlasting gift. It's an everlasting gift. That is what salvation of the soul is. And, you know, a, you know, a gift would imply that it's not earned or it's not bought. It's not something you had to do to achieve. And the fact that it's eternal, everlasting, means that it lasts forever. It's never lost. It can never be forsaken. It'll never be taken from you. Once God gives this to you, He's given you His Word, He will protect it and preserve it. And a lot of people will say, well, to be a Christian, you said everlasting in gift. I didn't hear repent of your sins. Right? Well, let me tell you, the Bible does not teach you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Right, right. This is a very important point. A lot of people are confused by that. The word repent simply means to turn. To change what direction you're going. To change your mind. To change your heart. I was driving up this road yesterday. I was going north. I repented. I started going south. There was no sin involved. I wasn't in sin because of the direction I was going. People get confused about the word repent. Whenever they hear the word repent, they think automatically it means you have to stop sinning to be saved. But really it means to change or to turn. You're in Acts chapter 11. Hold your place there. In, in Matthew 21 of Jesus warning the Jewish leaders, He said, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe on Him. Jesus defined repentance 
as believing. And he said to the Pharisees, the hypocrites, he said, hey, you don't believe. You have not repented because you didn't change your heart. So again, repent means to turn. It's to change your mind about how you get saved, about what you have to do to go to heaven. You're in Acts chapter 11. Find verse 21. Verse number 21. It says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Now go to Romans chapter 6. So here it clearly defines, it says, first we saw where it says that they they were obedient to the faith. And Jesus says it repented they, and believe. And then the same thing in Acts chapter 11. You believe and turn. So it's, it's in your mind, in your heart. You have to acknowledge, you have to change your mind about salvation. You have to realize that maybe you're going the wrong way about the wrong thing. Yeah. Right? To get to heaven, your soul is what goes to heaven. It's not your body. And too many people think, well, I have to get this body perfect. I have to repent of all my sins in my body to get to heaven. But it's not your body that's going to heaven. Your body will never be perfect. In Mark chapter 1, he says, And the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. When Jesus preached repentance, he defined it by saying, Believe the gospel. That's right. Believe the gospel. Now, we're, we're going to define the gospel here. In Hebrews 6, it tells us that repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So you have to repent of trusting in your dead works and turn to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, okay? You have, if you're trusting in your own works, if you say, well, I think I'm good enough to get to heaven. Well, I know Jesus opened the door, but now it's my responsibility to say, I'm sorry every night before I go to bed. That is dead works because you're doing it on your own. You have to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. You have to turn from trusting in your own works. Turn from believing in your heart that you're somehow good enough or that you will balance it out. And you have to turn and trust in Jesus alone in that free gift. It's either free or there's nothing. He said it's a free gift. You have to believe that Jesus paid for all of your sins. Not just a few of them. Not just the small ones. The big ones. Not just the obvious sins. He paid for the secret sins also. You know the Bible says that the thought of foolishness is sin. You understand? I mean, Some people think, well, the Ten Commandments. Yeah, but it's bigger than that. Right? If you're sitting around dreaming about winning the lottery, that's a sin. Right? That's a thought of foolishness. If, if you're just exaggerating, and you're, well, that's not really a lie. Well, hey, that's a sin. There are many things we do that are sins, and when you break God's law, there is a punishment, and that punishment is the death of the soul. You know, so we saw earlier, we said that many of the priests were obedient to the faith. You're in Romans chapter 6. Find verse number 17. Romans chapter 6, verse number 17. It says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. So what is salvation? It's obeying in your heart. It's of having a pure conscience before God, truly trusting in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. He says, in your heart, right? Obey means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul. There's only one way to heaven. Mohammed won't get you there. Buddha won't get you there. Right. The Catholic Church won't get you there. They're all preaching works. They're all saying, if you're good enough, you might make it in. And that is a lie. Amen. We're all found guilty. There are none righteous. No, not one. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We've all broken God's law. And because of that, we deserve judgment. That judgment is hell. Look at verse 22 in this chapter. Verse 22, it says, But now being made free from sin and becoming servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Writing to a saved person, he's saying, hey, you were not saved. Now you are saved. Now you're free from sin. You don't have to pay the punishment for sin. That has been paid for you. All the sins have been paid for. You're free from sin. What's the end of that? Everlasting life. Right? Going to heaven being with God when you die. Look at the next verse, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Wages are something you earn. You may earn a minimum wage. You earn a wage at work for what you do. We deserve death and hell because of our sin. The death it's referring to is not just your body. It's also dealing with your soul. 
Listen, the Bible teaches a concept of eternal security. He says that everlasting life, that lasts forever. There's a phrase people will use, once saved, always saved. I love that term. I don't have any problems with that term because the Bible is clear. Once your soul is saved, it will always be saved. And there's no guarantee your flesh is going to become perfect. And I think that's where a lot of people get it mixed up. They somehow think, well, i got to get my body right. Well, once I am saved, then I'll stop sinning. But that's a lie. That's impossible. No one in here can say, well, I have stopped sinning. I have quit. Hey, no, no. The thought of foolishness is sin. To exaggerate is a sin, right? To, to covet something that does not belong to you is a sin. We're all found guilty under God's law. We all deserve the punishment. And thank God, He gives us eternal security. You know, the Bible says, no man will pluck you out of my hand. Right? I use the example, I'm holding, if I'm holding my daughter by the hand and she tries to run away from me, it doesn't take much effort or strength for me to pull her back. I'm bigger than her. I got her. Right? God the Father is the same way with your soul. When you put your trust on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, He forever has you in His hand. No man can pluck you out of His hand, not even yourself. Right? And listen, the Bible also says that in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God has promised you the gift of eternal life. If He were a liar, He would take it back from you and it would not be eternal. Either eternal lasts from ever or it doesn't. Either eternal and His promise is something that is a sure thing or you're constantly in jeopardy wondering if you're saved or not saved. And that goes back to what's in your heart. What are you trusting in? If you're trusting in your own ability, in your own works, Plain and simple, you will not make it to heaven. Right. You know, the Bible says, by his own blood entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us all. Once he died, once he paid for sin, and now what we have is being redeemed in the soul forever, eternally. Like I said, the wages of sin is death. The Bible teaches that there, the second death, there is death and hell, that your soul will perish is another example it uses. John 3.16 that says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If you put your trust on Jesus Christ, if you're willing to humble yourself and say, well, I've been trying it my way, I'm going to repent of my way, and I'm going to have faith toward God, God has made you a promise that you can have the free gift. God bought you a gift. It's totally free. He's offering it to you. And if you don't have that, you're not a biblical Christian. So the first point here is that you have to be a biblical Christian. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And keep your place there in Romans 6. We're going to go right back to it. The Bible teaches in, in, Gen, in uh, Revelation 20, it talks about death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Because of my sin, because I've broken God's law, I deserve to be cast into hell. And hey, maybe my sin's not bad as yours. Maybe yours isn't as bad as mine, but it doesn't matter. We're all found guilty. We have all done things that are worthy of judgment of God. And He's made us this promise that we deserve hell, but He promises eternal life. He promises a free gift to get out of hell Amen. if we would only put our faith in Him alone. Yeah. Of course, Jesus died and went to hell for your sin. Yeah, he that punishment you deserve of, of burning in hell, Jesus died and went to hell. He died for your sins, yes, and He went to hell. It says, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that His soul was not left in hell. Now you're in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to see the simplicity of the Gospel here. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the Gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. So here, you have to believe the gospel. So what is the gospel? It defines it right here for us. Verse 2, By which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Listen, there are some people that have believed in vain. Those are fake Christians. Those are people that say, well, I'll give Jesus a try. But in their heart, they're not really believing. They're not trusting in Him alone. They say, well, I'll give it a test run. But these people he's writing to, he's defining the gospel, he says, ye are saved. That's present tense. It happens right now while you're still alive. 
And once you are saved, you're always saved. It's not something you have to work out over time and try to figure out if you still are saved. In fact, if you're in that position, I would challenge you. I would say you're not really saved. If you feel like if you just did the wrong thing that you would go to hell, then you're not saved. If you say, well, I'm not a murderer, but if you murdered, you would certainly have to go to hell. Well, guess what? We all deserve hell. And guess what? God has provided the free gift, the opportunity to get out of hell. Look at the next verse, verse number 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Jesus was God. He paid for everything you'll ever do that's wrong. He's already paid for it. And He's offering you eternal redemption in the form of a gift. The gift has been paid for. It's purchased. It's freely available. It's up to you to take it. If you reject it and say, oh, I'm not ready for it, then guess what? You're on your way to hell. Well, maybe later in life, or, or I know I still think I have to try to be a good person. You're rejecting the free gift. He's, he died for your sins. You don't have to die for Him. You don't have to go to hell. Look at verse 4. And that He was buried... And He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So what is the Gospel? To believe that Jesus died for your sins. To trust that he he, they put His body in the tomb and He came back to life. He resurrected of His own power. Listen, only God can bring the dead back to life. Only God can forgive sins. And He's offering you that as a gift. You have to have faith that God paid your sin debt 100%. Every sin you'll ever commit has already been paid for. Now it's up to you to take that free gift. Amen. Turn back to Romans chapter 6. In John 1.12 it says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Listen, power in the Christian life starts with believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing that Jesus was God. He is the Son of God. He is the one that purchased your redemption trusting in Him alone. And if you're not sure about that, if you say, well, I'm not really sure, I don't know, hey, ask me after the service. I will show you. I'll help you be sure. Ask one of the men, one of the ushers. We will gladly help you see the truth. Amen. You're in Romans chapter 6. Look, the first point is, what is biblical salvation? The second point is, what is biblical baptism? What is biblical baptism? Why do we do baptism? Baptism is a picture of being spiritually dead and coming back alive. In other words, you were not saved, you were dead, and now you have an alive spirit that will be alive forevermore, it says. Therefore, you are alive. You have God's alive spirit. We do this as a picture of what Jesus did, how He died for our sins. He was put in the tomb, He was put in the ground, and then He rose again. This is the picture that Jesus taught. And so, we'll look at what is baptism, who should get baptized, and how should you get baptized? You're in Romans chapter 6. Look at verse number 3. And by the way, on a side note, baptism does not save. All right. If you say, well, I've talked to people that say, All right, I say, are you going to heaven? They say, oh yeah, I was baptized. Well, wait a minute. What do you trust in? You're trusting in your baptism? That's dead works. All right. Baptism does not save you. If you say, well, I am saved, but I've never been baptized. Will I still go to heaven? Absolutely. Baptism is something that comes after faith we're going to see. Look at verse number 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Right? So it's a picture of His death. Look at the next verse. Therefore we are, builded, we are buried with Him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So he says it's like as Christ was raised, raised up, you also should walk as a new man. You should walk as a new person. You should stop the old ways and move on to new ways. You should walk in the Spirit instead of the flesh. This is the point of baptism. It's to make this outward confession, but it's also a, it's like the first step of obedience for a Christian. When a Christian says, well, you know, I know it's what it says, but I don't feel like doing it. Well, I did it years ago, and, and then I got saved, and I don't feel like doing it again, because then everybody's going to know. You know, listen, that's not the right attitude. God wants you to humble yourself, be obedient to the Scriptures. He commands us, because this is something that in the likeness, in His picture, then we receive newness. Look at the next verse, verse number 5. It says, 
For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Listen, this is also a picture that one day, after this body dies, I will have a brand new body. I will be resurrected from the dead by the power of God, just as Jesus was. And when Jesus was resurrected, he has a body that will not corrupt, it will not perish. I mean, he's walking through walls and doing all sorts of cool stuff. Hey, I look forward to that day when this old body, I can let it go away and get something new. That's kind of an awesome promise. Now turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. In Acts 2, when you see the, the church growing by the thousands, it says, Then they that gladly received His Word were baptized. So immediately they hear the preaching, they receive what's being preached, they said, hey, I believe that. I want to be baptized also. I want to make this outward profession, teaching what I believe. So who should be baptized? Who should be baptized? The Bible teaches that all believers, all Christians, should be baptized. You're in Acts chapter 8. Look at verse number 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto certain water, and the eunuch said, See... Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Great question. This guy's reading the Bible. This guy's preaching to him. And all of a sudden he says, okay, well, wait a minute. There's some water right there. What's keeping me from being baptized? Huge question. What is it? What, what, I'm ready. What's, what do I have to do? Look what the guy says. This is the qualifying question. Verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest... Right, so verse 37 is pointing out here that only a born-again Christian should get baptized. This disqualifies babies. This disqualifies infant baptism that the Calvinists do. That, that, I mean, how many different denominations? The Orthodox, the Catholics, there's so many of them that believe, well, we'll just sprinkle this baby and call it baptism. That is not baptism. Look what he says, verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. You must have faith. You must be saved to be baptized. Amen. If you, verse 37 is that qualifier. And some Bibles actually take that out because they were influenced by the Catholics. So that means no babies. Babies are not allowed to be baptized. But the question, so how do we get baptized? Look at the next verse. Verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So they went down into the water. Now turn to Acts chapter 16. Go ahead a few pages. Acts chapter 16. They go down into the water. They come back up out of the water. It's the likeness of God dying, going into the grave, and coming back up to life. Sprinkling in no way resembles that. And there are many protestant denominations which by the way we are not protestant the protestants came out of the catholic church listen the true christian church was long before the catholic church we've been around hey it talks about the church in the wilderness it talks there was a congregation of true believers from the beginning and there will be to the end and that is separate from organized religion i was talking with a lady yesterday she said oh yeah organized religion yeah it's just like organized crime some of it you know what can we do to fleece the sheep right <laughs> and so i mean where we should have order in God's house here, but a lot of the organized religion have bad doctrine because they're being led by the devil. They are led by Satan. And it blows people's mind that, that, it, that why would you even sprinkle? And there are even Protestants that would say, well, during the persecution of the Catholics, we couldn't openly baptize, so therefore, you know, we would just sprinkle. Wait a minute, see, because of the Catholics, you're going to do it the Catholics' way. That doesn't make any sense. You're going to tell me you couldn't find a tub of water? You're going to tell me you couldn't find a river to go in? doesn't make any sense. In Mark 1 of Jesus, it said, and when he was being baptized, it says he's straightway coming up out of the water. Jesus came out of the water. He went down into the water. You go up into the water. A picture of his death and resurrection. And listen, since you have been saved, if you have not been baptized properly, if you haven't been dunked under the water, it didn't count. Yeah. Listen, if you got baptized years ago, and then you found out that you weren't saved and you corrected it, you just got wet before. You can't just take a shower, take a bath, and say, oh, I got baptized. Oh, there's a proper way to do it. There's a proper picture of it. And you need to redo it if you're in question of that. Now, you're in Acts chapter 16. Look at verse number 29. Here in Acts chapter 16, there Paul is in prison. There's an earthquake. 
It sets everybody free. The, the, the jailer is about to like kill himself. He's so worried because he knows that he would lose his job. They will probably behead him. And so you see, look, we pick that story up in verse 29. It says, Then he called for a light and sprang in and came in trembling and fell, fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Best question in the whole Bible. This guy's to the point of death. He knows that his, his life is on the line and there's this miracle in the jail. And he's, instead of dying, oh, what do I have to do to be saved? What, how can I know for sure my soul is going to heaven? Look what he says, 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now it says, and thy house, not because if, if, I, if daddy has faith, the kids are automatically going to heaven. Look at the next verse. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took him the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and baptized he and he and all his straightway now go to Matthew 28 so he's saying this guy he, he heard it what do I have to do believe he got saved he okay now take me to my house let's go meet my family please preach to my family so they also can be saved so it says that they spake unto him the word of the Lord you don't get saved by just some thought or something. You have to hear the Bible. You have to hear the Word of the Lord to be saved. You can't take that out of the Gospel. You can't say that, you know, that, that salvation is just by, well, I had this moment. I was sitting at home and I thought I saw the clouds open up and I saw a picture and I said, yeah, that's it. That's salvation. Listen, there are a lot of people with funny experiences that they, uh, stories that they would say, well, I know that I'm saved because I got in this car wreck and I just know that God's not done with me yet. Well, maybe He's preserved you long enough so you can hear the Word of God, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, get saved, and then do what this guy did, and then get baptized immediately. They did it the same hour. right? They helped heal the, the Paul, and then they got baptized. Of course, they took him back to prison. But all believers are commanded after salvation to get baptized. If you got baptized before you believed, you need to redo it. If you have any doubts, if you say, well, I know I was saved, but... I was in one of these funny churches where I don't even think the pastor... It, look, if you have any doubts, just redo it. But it's not about the man that baptizes you. It's about your willingness to do it, your humility of just admitting that what the Bible says is right and doing what the Bible says. That's where God rewards you. In Acts 10, it says, And He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 10, I mean, these people, okay, I get it, I believe it, now what? And He commanded them to be baptized. You're in Matthew chapter 28. Go to the end of the chapter here. Find verse number 18. And Jesus came in and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So here Jesus said, Hey, I've got all the power in heaven and in earth. So He sends His disciples in power doing what? teaching them once you get saved baptize right. get baptized in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit Amen. that is god's biblical pattern that is his commandment to show the resurrection so the first point is what is biblical salvation the second is what is biblical baptism my third point is why do we go to church why do we go to church listen there are a lot of christians that are not in church or they're in the wrong church for the wrong reason, and they are not spiritually growing. This is very important. If you are omitting the commandment of going to church, you're not going to have growth in your life. You're not, you will not have spiritual growth. Right? Jesus said here that all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And it's Jesus that sends His disciples in power. If you want power on your life, you need to be in church. And I'm going to show you. Right? Because what's He do next? He says, go ye. Jesus says, because I have all the power... Go ye. You need to go out and do some things. Look at verse 20 in this chapter. Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. He's saying, hey, now you need to teach. Right? We go to church to learn. We go to church to teach. We have a men's preaching night where the men get up and they study something for themselves. They decide what they're going to preach on. They do it out of God's Word. And God's Holy Spirit works through them as they preach the Word of God. 
I love it. I learn from it. It's a great opportunity in this church. You know, and we also come to church to learn. Listen, as the preacher of this church, I learn from other people in the church. I learn when, when the little kids come back from evangelizing, from preaching the gospel, and they start telling me things. Man, that puts it in my mind. It puts it on my radar. It puts it like, hey, that's an emphasis. With this child just out of the mouth of babes, right? God reveals things to us. And even all the more from these men of God and from these ladies and the families that are in our church that are in God's will, we can all learn from one another. Listen, I'm not the only one you can learn from here. Brother Marcel can teach you. Brother Dale can teach you. Brother Zach can teach you. I can go. Brother Doug can teach you. I can go around the room. All of these men that are studying their Bible, God's power of the Holy Spirit is on their life. And you can learn from them if you're willing. If you'll go to church. You know, you think about it. This is Church is sort of like spiritual exercise. Right? Go, go to church and do some spiritual reps. Right? Why do you go to the gym? Why do you go to the gym? To get stronger, right? Right? To, 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 get, to get, help your, your physical character, you know, to get stronger muscles. You know, but in 1 Timothy 4 it says, Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. It is hard, exercise is hard work. Right? Lifting weights or running is not easy. It pushes your body. And the Bible teaches us here we should exercise ourselves unto godliness. It's not easy. It's difficult. We have to force ourselves to do it. He goes on, he says, For bodily exercise profiteth little. Yes, if you do, if you eat healthy and keep your body in, in, in the right you know, area, then maybe you'll live an extra five years longer and that would profit you that you can do more for God. Yeah. Or maybe if you're not eating all the junk food, then you won't die you know, with, full of cancer where the last 10 years of your life you're laid up in a bed and maybe you can actually go out and do something for God. Right? So bodily exercise profiteth little, but he says, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Do you know there are people that eat junk food that are that are their body's a mess, their life is their is a mess, their health is way out of order, but they're actually trying to be godly. They're learning the word of God, and God can use that person more than a healthy, weak Christian. Yeah. Right? Healthy in the flesh, weak in the spirit. Right? Hey, whether or not you exercise isn't what this is about. The point is, I want you to connect some dots. You know people go to the gym. You know they spend time at the gym. You know people do certain things to keep their health. What are you doing for your spiritual health? Are you exercising godliness? Now that you're saved, God wants you to obey His commandments. Yeah. Right? Now that you're saved and your soul is eternal, secure, the Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works right. and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Are you doing spiritual exercise? Because that's really what church is for. If you're not going to church, you're missing out on so many things. And listen, a, a very famous verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Right? Exercise is works. Getting saved is not works. Exercise is easy, it's free. Okay? But he goes on, he says, For, he says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now that you're saved, He wants to use you to do good works. You cannot put the good works before the cross. After you're saved, after the cross, yes, get some good works. Exercise some godliness in your life and, and you know, grow as a Christian. And it starts by going to church. This is the spiritual gym. It's right here. Right? This is how you change your priorities in life. Listen, if any of you in here go to the gym more hours in a week, then you go to church, you got a problem. Uh -oh. That profits little, but the Bible says godliness profits all things. Right. You understand God will give you the wisdom and the power in your life if you're willing to exercise godliness. Good. If you're willing to exercise godliness, he will give you he will give you power over all things, not just your health. That's little things. Look, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We come to church to learn from each other. We come to church to inspire each other. There's certain people when they walk in here, man, it's an encouragement. Brother Nicholas travels for Man, it's good to see him. He hasn't always been able to make the trip. It's good to see him. Brother Matthew's back in church. Praise the Lord, man. That's an encouragement to me. That's exciting. God is doing something here. There are families that are here that God is using to bless other people. And when you look around and say, man, look what God's doing. You're inspiring me to do more for God. You're inspiring me to live for God. This is how God works in the church. And Jesus said, I will build my church 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yeah. God wants to call out a, 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 a local assembly, a local church, a body of believers to strengthen each other, to learn together of God, to learn from Him, to encourage each other, and the gates of hell will not prevail. I don't care if there's a hundred atheists standing outside that door and they all want to, they want to put us to death. God has more spiritual power than they have physical power. God is greater than them. And we need to learn that we have to exercise our inner man. We have to exercise our spiritual man by learning of God. And it starts with church. And like I said, Moses, it talks about in Acts chapter 7, it says that there was a church in the wilderness. The church is not just a New Testament thing. It didn't just start in Matthew 16. It didn't start in Acts chapter 2. It didn't start in 300 AD with the Catholics. Listen, the church has always been around. Church means congregation. Congregation. A, a, an assembly of people. A group of believers. And we go to church not for the music. Let me tell you, if you're going to church for, for the music, oh man, the show, the lights, the smoke... Yeah, the rock and roll. You're going to church for the wrong thing. Yeah, That's right. not what church is about. That's right. Right. If you want to watch rock and roll, if you want go to the, go down and watch the bands on the beach. Yeah. Forget about it on a Sunday morning, right? Well, wouldn't you rather watch the real thing instead of a bunch of wannabes anyway? Think about it. Not that I'm 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 advocating for that, but you know we don't go to church for superficial, for fleshly reasons. You don't go to church just to see all your your good old buddies, your old buddies that you used to go to the bar with. Now you go to the church with. Wrong church. Wrong reason. Listen, church is for spiritual growth. It's not for meeting people to grow your business. Well, I'm just network marketing and I'm getting contacts so I can tell them what I do and maybe you know, pitch them on insurance or something. Listen, that's not what church is for either. It's not for Amway. We don't sell in the church. Nothing is for sale in this church. And look, there are a lot of people that get this, this emotional high from the worship time, right? Yeah. Church is not an emotional high. It's not about... Just, just, you know, singing these vague songs that are not specific about what God has done. Yeah. Church is to learn about the Word of God. Amen. The power that's in the Word. And if you want to find the will in your life, come to church. Right? If the church you go to or the, you've seen other churches you've been to where it's like a 15 minute pep talk. Hey, good job. Don't change anything. You're on the right track. That's not church. Right? right? Church should correct you. Church should say, hey, whoa. You want to do it better? Do it this way. Yeah. Hey, you looking for a problem? This, the Bible is compared to a mirror. You look into it, you see the real you. You see the spiritual you. Right. You see the state of your soul. But if you never open up the Bible, if you never hear the preaching, then you don't see these things. You're not aware of these things, and you're more likely to live in the flesh. Look here in Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse number 24. It says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Consider one another to provoke. Provoke makes me think of putting your finger in somebody's chest. Right? You've seen people provoke a fight. Hey, hey, buddy. Right? Well, the Bible says to consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Hey, where you been? I missed you. How are you? Hey, I want to see you in church. Man, it's good to see. I missed you. Come to church. We're supposed to provoke each other to be loving. Look what he says in the next verse, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Church is somewhere where we encourage each other. We exhort one another. We do it through love. We go out together doing good works, preaching the gospel. Turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. In Ephesians 1, it says, And he hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Jesus gave power to his disciples. Jesus gives power to the church. He says, Which is his body in the next verse. You understand, Christ died for the church. He laid down his own body. He did it as an example, as a picture. Marriage is a picture of how much God loves the local church. And He's given all power to us, the power especially to learn of His Word, to learn who He is. And He instituted the church, and it needs to be a priority. And people that don't have church as a priority, they're not going to have the spiritual growth that they could. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 19, it says, Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also. 
The point of the church is to teach others. The point of the church is to increase your learning. Yeah. If you go to church and you get that warm, fuzzy feeling, but you didn't learn anything, it's a waste of time. Yeah. You pat you on the back, and then the next day everything's back to the way it was. You ought to increase your understanding of God. We need to learn more about who Jesus is. That's why we go to church. You say, well, I know who He is. Yeah, but there's so many things about God. that, we, that are, it, it, It's still a mystery. There are so many things from the beginning and the end that we see about the Son of God that can be learned if you go to church. Now you're in John chapter 1. Look at verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Listen, we go to church to hear the Word preached, but it also teaches us that Jesus is the Word. It says that He was with God and He is God. Look at the next verse. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Did you know that Jesus was the creator of the universe? The Bible teaches it. There's a bunch of verses. But these, this is one of the reasons we go to church. Hey, I want to know all the verses. We should study that out, right? This is something you'll learn at church. Look at verse number 14. Verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here it says, the Word was made flesh. People say, oh, mock us. Well, you, you worship the Bible. Listen, it's not about this paper, this cardboard, this book. But the words that are on the page are living words. Amen. They are written by the one true living God. He's given it to us for a reason. This is the foundation of our church. This is the authority in our church. Amen. What is written in here, I must submit myself to. If I say something that's wrong and you point it out to me and you show me in the Bible, I will admit I'm wrong. This isn't about what I, my opinion. It's about what God has said. Whether I like it or not, it's a fact. And it's very important because He teaches the Word was made flesh. Are you turning to turn to Psalm chapter 12? But you know, there are a lot of Bibles today that omit very important things. In 1 John 5, 7, the Bible says, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. The Bible teaches the Trinity. It says that we are made in God's image. We have a body, soul, and a spirit. There is a likeness. We are made in His likeness. But it teaches that the Word was made flesh. Now, 1 John 5, 7, where it says, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, that verse is deleted in all of the new popular Bibles. That verse is totally deleted. You literally go from verse number 6 to 8. Or they reword it. Some of them reword it and they keep it there, but they've cut the verse in half to where they take out the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. There is a conspiracy among Bibles to change them, to delete things that are in the Bible so that you can teach other doctrines. This is a big deal. Listen, if you have an NIV this morning, that verse is deleted. If you have an ESV, it's deleted. If you have a New Living Translation, it's deleted. An NASV, an RSV, and many, many others... It's deleted. Now we learn that Jesus is the Word that became flesh and we learn that He is with, it was the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. But how can you accurately describe that in a Bible that's deleting doctrine about God? Listen, this is a big deal. My first point was, what is biblical salvation? The second is, what is biblical baptism? The third was, why do we go to church? And the fourth is, which is the right Bible? If, if there's a conspiracy to change the Bibles, surely God is big enough to protect one Bible and to make sure that one of them is at least right. Now look, you're in Psalm chapter 12. I want you to look at verse number 1. Help, Lord, the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double tongue do they speak. Psalm 12 gives us this warning here that the faithful are failing from the land. Right In America, you could say that we are not as righteous as we used to be. There are not as many Christians today as we used to have. The faithful are failing and it's because of the lies, the vanity, the double tongue. Listen, all these other Bibles, the, the wrong Bibles, the false Bibles, they change the Word of God. 
They speak with a double tongue. They speak out of both sides of their mouth. They literally contradict themselves. There's a problem with the Bibles today. And listen, I'll make it real simple for you. That what we call the, the King James Bible today, it was known as the authorized version. It was known as the Holy Bible initially. And they started calling it the King James Bible to make a distinction because of all these new and popular versions that were coming up, yeah. mostly propagated by the Catholics, by the Jesuit. But I'll make it real simple. The King James Bible has over 4,000 copies that, that are identical. Whereas the newer Bibles, the, the reason they make the changes, they have less than 40 copies that say, well, we deleted this verse, we deleted that verse. And listen, of these copies, these are not complete copies. It's not like you're, you're walking up and seeing a whole Bible. A lot of them are just simply, well, I've got one book and part of it's missing. Or I've got this one letter and I don't have this verse. So therefore, what they're doing is they're making a straw man argument. Well, if it's not in this one, we should delete it from these 4,000. There is a conspiracy to change the Bibles today. It's very important to understand. Look at verse number 6 here. Do you believe God is big enough to preserve His Word? Think about it. He made you. There's more information. You go pick a flower. You go pick that dandelion out there. There is more knowledge and data just in that one flower than all the computers of the world. There is more information in what God has made than what man could ever do. And if He's big enough to make you and sustain your life and keep breath in your lungs. I think he's, he's big enough to protect His Word. Amen. The Bible. Look at verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Forever. It's God's job to keep them, to preserve them, to keep them from generation forever. It's our job to read it. All right? That's the problem. Most Christians don't have power in their life because they don't know their Bible. They're not reading their Bible. Now look, if you've got the wrong Bible, that's a problem. Now turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. We have some handouts in the back, and these are freely available. It's got over 300 verses that have been changed in all the modern Bibles. If you don't have one of these, take one on your way out. Or if you'd like to print it out for yourself at home, just go to our website, steadfastjacksonville.com slash Bible. On that it shows in this and on there it shows there are 16 verses that have been completely deleted. Like Acts chapter 8 verse 37 we looked at earlier. Like 1 John 5, 7 and many others. Right? It also shows there's over 300 major changes where they take out the name the Lord Jesus Christ. They delete the God, Godhead. They delete Jesus out of the Bible. They delete the miracles. You know, of those 16 verses, it could be said there's actually 25 that may delete in footnotes. A lot of the new Bibles will put a little star and it's a study Bible at the bottom. It says, well, this wasn't really in the originals. And when, again, when, when the new Bibles say the originals or in the text, they're talking about these 40 partial copies of the Bible that are questionable. They're not talking about the 4,000 sure copies that have been around. It's not the same that's always been. There is a conspiracy. There is an intention by the devil to change the Bible. They want to make it appealing and say it's easier to understand. And that actually, too, is a lie. There is a deception there. There are many documentaries you can watch. I don't think we have any copies this morning. Normally we do. But New World Order Bible versions. You can watch it for free on YouTube. It gives you a great, a great view of the history. Another one is A Lamp in the Dark. Lamp in the Dark. This is there's a three-part series on the history of the Bible, how it came together. Another one that you may have to rent is called uh, KJB, The Book That Changed the World. They're all very good uh, video evidence of documentaries that's showing how the Bible came to be. It wasn't just up to King James. There were many godly men and great scholars. Maybe they weren't all godly men, but there were great scholars also that spoke many, many languages that, that were used of God to preserve and protect His Word to every generation. If you don't believe that, then I, I would challenge you to watch those and check it out for yourself. But listen, I want you to know, you can trust the Bible. Yeah. Now that you're saved, now that you believe the Lord, you're baptized, you're moving forward in God's life, and it's like, man, I've got the best sword on the market. That's right. What are you doing with it? Uh -oh. You know how many people I've seen, they'll say, well, you know, I think I'm going to try bicycling. I've got a friend, he rides a bicycle, so I'm going to do all the research. I want the carbon fiber frame, and I want, this, I want the spokeless design, and I want this fancy air. You know, and I'm going to spend $2,000 on a bike. 
to set it in the closet. Right? That's a lot, a lot of Christians, they figured out, okay, I figured it out, I got the right one. I'm going to leave it on my desk. Listen, there is a spiritual warfare today. Yeah, there is. You have to pick up the sword to defend yourself. You have to pick up the sword to, to set the captives free, to get your family saved, to get your friends saved, to make sure they're going to heaven. You've got to know the power of the Word of God. You have to trust the Word of God. You have to use it. Right. I have a buddy many years ago, and you know I, I've heard soul winning. I hear a lot of people, oh, I read all the books. I read the Quran. I read the Bhagavad Gita. No, you didn't. You're a liar, yeah. right? How many, oh, I read the whole Bible. Oh, did you quote one verse? <laughs> Can't do it, right? But I had a buddy several years ago, and he did. He has read all the books. He had copies of them all. And when I met him, he was not saved. He got saved, and he read the whole Bible like in a month. And he was like, well, now that I know which one is right, now I want to read it. Because he saw the conspiracy from the outside looking in as an unsaved man. He said, well, why are there so many Bibles? Because there's only one Quran. Why do we have 300 Bibles? He knew that he figured something was wrong, and when he figured it out, he got saved, he read the whole Bible all the way through. He got zealous about his Bible reading. Listen, and this guy grew spiritually greater than some men that I knew that have been saved their whole life. Wow. There are people that, well, I just read, you know, one proverb a day. That's great. But it's not enough. It's not good enough. If you're doing nothing, start reading a proverb of the day. Whatever the day is, read that proverb. But if you'll read the Bible 15 minutes a day, you can finish it this year. You read it an hour a day you can you can read it four times in a year how valuable is it this is what God has given you to do battle to help yourself to have power in your life are you using it are you willing to sacrifice your time look you're in second Peter chapter 1 find verse number 16 verse number 16 it says for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we were made known unto you the power of and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice from Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He's referring back to the point, what was, what's commonly called the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus revealed His spiritual glory and power to a few of His disciples. They saw it. They were eyewitnesses. They're saying, I'm not repeating something I heard. This isn't some fable. I know for a fact that Jesus was God. We saw God the Father open up the heaven and say, this is my Son. They knew it was the Savior. This is the Son of God everyone was waiting for. The Christ, the Savior. And he says, but listen, look what he says. Look what he goes on. Verse number 18, he says, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with Him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy he's saying i saw those things i saw miracles i literally saw heaven opened up and god speaking but the words the bible is more sure it's more dependable than what you think you saw what you think you heard he's saying what's written here will last forever god will protect it look what he says we have a more sure word of prophecy Whereunto ye do well that take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. He's saying you would do well to take heed to the Bible. It would do you great things in your life if you would just open it up, read what it says, obey it, accept it as the Word of God, and begin to grow. It will shine a light in your dark heart. It will help you shine a light in the darkness of the world. It will help you overcome the power of darkness. Take heed in your life to the Word of God. Look at verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. If I speak something about the Bible, I have to prove it from the Bible. I can't just make it, well, because I said so, it makes it so. No, not around here. The Bible's the authority. No prophecy, no preaching is of any private interpretation. All right, all right. Well, I feel people that wear red shirts are in sin. That's a private interpretation. That's wrong. Wait a minute, i got some guys in here that need to deal with No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but think about it. The Bible's making it clear. We have an authority structure. How can you check that the things that I say are true? Right, you remember the Bereans? 
They were reading to make sure what they heard was so. They were studying the word every single day to find out what they were hearing at church, whether it was right or not. As Christians, we've lost that. As Christians, if we would regain that, we would have power in our life. Look what he says. For the prophecy, verse 21, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. These men were exercising holiness, and it says here, the Holy Spirit worked through them. It wasn't the will of man. They didn't just sit down and say, I'm going to write this cool story. No. God, through His Spirit, through these men, preached what was necessary. God made sure it got written down, what He wanted written down, and now He's making sure that you have it in your hand today. And listen, if you don't have a Bible, grab one off the shelf when you leave. Right? If you say, oh, I got the wrong Bible. I got a new King James instead of a King James. Don't make a big deal out of it. Walk over there, pick one up, take it with you, free of charge when you leave, right? Those are free. Everything's free in this church. The, the, we've received it for free. We give it for free. Right. Listen, God wants you to have the right Bible. You need to have confidence in the Bible. And I would, I would encourage you. There's a lot of you in here already. Well, I already know I got the right Bible. Great. What are you doing with it? Are you actually using it? Are you at least doing 15 minutes a day? Right? You men that say one day I want to be a preacher myself. I want to be a pastor. Hey, are you doing an hour a day? We ought to. We ought to be willing to sacrifice. Well, you know what? The body wants to sleep in. Right? But the Spirit says I want to grow mightily and have God's power on my life. I'm willing to sacrifice for some spiritual growth. Look, the first point is what, what, what is biblical salvation? The second is what is biblical baptism? The third is why do we go to church? The fourth is which one is the right Bible? The last point is how can I have spiritual power? How can I have spiritual power? There's three basic points here. This is going to be real short. We're almost over. But I want you to pay attention. These three things are not very big and mysterious. They're very simple. But these are the three things most Christians do not have. It's pray, read, and preach. Pray, read, and preach. Do you want to get God's power in your life? You need to change your priorities and you need to change your perspective of the world. It's simple. Pray, read, pray. Turn to, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. This is one of the last places we'll go here. The Bible says that we pray through the Father to the Son. How do I pray to God? I pray, Father. Right? And I ask in the, in the name of Jesus, the Son. That's how we pray. And it's, it's, that's, there's no other way. I was talking to a lady yesterday. Well... We don't really pray to Mary. We pray through Mary. Well, I'm sorry that doesn't work. Mary was a human being. She needs a Savior just like we do. Mary's in the same boat as us. Mary's in heaven because she was righteous, but not in heaven because she's God. Not in heaven because she's supernatural. Right? She was not always a virgin also. The Catholics teach that. There's some strange doctrine to go along with that. But listen, praying has to go to the Father through the Son. In 1 John 5 it says, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask. We know we have the petitions that we desired of Him. The Bible is saying whatever, once you're saved, God's Holy Spirit is living in you, you ask your dad for something, He's going to give it to you. Right. If it's in His will, obviously. Lord, I just need that Lamborghini. That's not God's will for my life. All right? I don't want a Lamborghini. <laughs> I'd have to mail in my, my driver's license. No, but consider that. Sometimes we pray for things and we say, well, well, how come I didn't get what I wanted? Well, maybe God doesn't want you to have it because you would destroy yourself. Yeah. Maybe you're not spiritually mature yet enough to get something like that. Consider what you pray for. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, he says, pray without ceasing. How do you pray? All the time. When do you pray? Every moment of the day. Who do you call when you have a problem? Well, I don't know. We we got to call the plumber. We got to call the doctor. We better call this electrician. Hey, why don't you talk? Why don't you call God first? Amen. Are you praying step by step through the day? Are you praying without ceasing? Are you constantly trying to be in conversation with God because He will lead you and guide you into all truth through His Holy Spirit? Listen in Philippians four. He says, "Be careful for nothing, but everything." He says, "Everything in prayer." We go to God for everything. Well, but not my physical needs. Yes, your physical needs, your daily bread. God wants you to ask Him first. God wants you to seek Him for provision. He says, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, 
Let your request be made known unto God. Don't forget to say thanks, God. Oh, by the way, answered prayer, thank you. There's a young man I was talking with, Brother Chambers, yesterday. And this guy, his, his life's a wreck. He's having all sorts of problems. He's addicted to heroin. And Brother Chambers said, what do, you, what do I do? What can I do to help this guy? I said, you know, sometimes maybe jail is an answer to get that, to get, so it'll save that guy's life. The guy's saved. I would hate for him to die in a ditch with a needle in his arm. But it's like, maybe we should pray the guy goes to jail. Listen, I hate jail. I don't want anybody to go to jail. But you know what happened? That guy went to jail yesterday. Wow. It's not of me. It's what he did. It was his choice. But God, his father, is looking out for him. And he says, you want to keep living like this? And then I'm going to take control of your freedom to help get your spirit back on track. Y'all pray for that guy. This guy's in serious hurt right now. Look, you're in 1 Corinthians 2. Stay there for a second. And... In James 1 5 this is very important it says if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of God I believe this young man was asking God for the right thing to do and then he still went against what he knew he ought to do this guy keeps making the wrong decisions God's gonna say okay come on let me take your liberty from you let me take your freedom and and try to force you and give you a last chance don't let your life get that way where you have to hit rock bottom before you start praying you should start your day on your knees. You should start your day. Just take five minutes. Get by yourself and just start thanking God for what He's given you. Start asking God for the provision of the responsibilities that you have. He says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. It shall be given him. Listen, one of the last points. You have to pray. You have to read. You have to preach. As Christians, you're commanded to preach. Acts 1, it says, Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses of me. Why does God give us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Well, it secures our soul, right? It gives us knowledge. It leads us and guides us into truth. But it's also for boldness in preaching. Yeah. God has given us the Holy Spirit to be bold enough to stand up to somebody that, well, you're not really a Christian, are you? Yeah, I am. Oh, you're a Christian. Yes, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible. Oh, you believe fables. No, I believe the truth. God is real and you know it in your heart. And I believe that. God's given us the power for preaching. And listen, we should preach. If you're not preaching, if you've never preached the gospel, if you've never tried to get somebody else saved, you need to do that. In 1 Corinthians 1, he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. To the people that are on their way to hell, when you say, hey, Jesus died for your sins, they think that's foolish. They don't understand it says, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Okay, think I'm a fool. But I'm going to cry. I'm going to compel you. I'm going to show you out of the... You have to believe this or you'll end up in hell. The people that hate us, we love them enough to try to tell them the truth. The people that mock us, I love them. I want them to know what Jesus did. And if they continue to mock Jesus and mock Jesus and mock Jesus, they better be careful. They might cross that line. Look, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Find verse number 1. And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He's saying, when I came and preached the gospel unto you, I didn't come in here with some big fancy presentation. I'm not trying to use all these uh, theological words that nobody understands. Well, if you go back to the Latin, and I give you this, it's like people get confused when you do that. And, and there, are, there is a false religious crowd that loves to do that. But here this is written for us to understand this is not God's way. God's way is to keep it simple. The simplicity of the gospel. Look what he says in verse 2. He says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He said, I'm not, we're not going to get off track on talking about how, you know, the sordiology, the eschatology, the, the any of the ologies. He says, I want you to know the simplicity of who Jesus is, that He's God, that He died for your sins, and you have to know that first and foremost. Look at verse 3. And I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the power, I'm sorry, of the Spirit and of power. He's saying, I didn't come up with a bunch of fancy words and I'm trying to trick you into something. He says, it's God's Holy Spirit that worked through me to convince you to tell you these things are so. I kept it simple so you would understand. I'm not using really big words and making it complicated. I want everyone to know the simplicity of the truth. And he did it 
in God's Holy Spirit, which gave him power. He preached the Bible simply, and that was powerful. God's Spirit was powerful enough. He didn't have to have a big presentation or big fancy words. Look what he says in verse 5. Why did he do that? He says, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. If, if I, why are you, how'd you get saved? Well, man, this guy put on such an amazing presentation. You have to go see it. Boy, he connected all the dots and used all these big words. I can't remember. Well, how did you get saved? Hey, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the difference? And today there's a problem in religion that you have. Everybody wants to make it really big and fancy and, and they ignore the simplicity of the gospel. They yeah. don't believe that Jesus was God. Now turn to Revelation chapter 1. Last place we're going. Revelation chapter number 1. The Bible says that the Spirit will bear witness with your spirit. When you go out preaching, when you're willing to open up your mouth and preach the gospel to somebody, when you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit living in you, that Holy Spirit will bear witness with other people. Other people will say, yeah, wow, I just felt like God was talking to me through this person. I mean, when they opened the Bible, it was so easy to understand. I've always wondered these things, but you just you had all the answers right there. Listen, it's not about you as the preacher. It's about the words of God, the Spirit of God giving you power in your life. But listen, you have to pray, you have to read, you have to preach. If you will do these three things as a Christian, I promise you, I guarantee, you will have power in your life. God will give you power over all things in the other areas of your life. But if you omit them, then you're rejecting the commandment of God. You're ignoring very important things that He's told you to do. In Ephesians 6, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord. It's His might we have confidence in. It's His power that we use. In Revelation 1, it says, look at verse number 3. Blessed is he that readeth. Do you want God's blessing on your life? Right here. There's a blessing for reading the Word of God. Amen. And they that hear the words of this prophecy... There is a blessing for listening to the preaching at church. Yep. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. When he says keep those things that are written in there, that's exercising godliness. That's obeying the commandment. Well, God says I shouldn't drink anymore. That's what it says in the Bible. Well, what do you want to do? Do you want God's blessing on your life? Well, God says I shouldn't have filthy conversation. I shouldn't be saying those jokes anymore. Do you want God's blessing on your life? Right? The Bible says, I shall put no wicked thing before my eyes. God is commanding us to stop looking at the wickedness of the world. Stop looking at things that you shouldn't look at on the computer and on the TV. Amen. Do you want God's blessing on your life? Obey His Word. Do what He's telling you. Otherwise, you will not have any power on your life. That's right. Look, He says, the time is at hand. You understand, as Jesus was wrapping up His ministry, He told people this was the last days. Yeah, but that was 2,000 years ago. Well, in the big picture of things, it's over 6,000 years that the earth has existed. And in the last 2,000 years, do you think it's closer now than it was when you first believed? Do you think it's closer now than it was in Jesus' time? Yes. The time is at hand. The devil is trying to set up his kingdom. There is a conspiracy against Christians. They want you to get distracted by the world. They want you to try to look and act like everybody else instead of obeying God's Word. You need to heed to the Bible. He said you'll do well if you heed to the Bible. Exercise godliness. It's time to change your priorities. It's time to change your focus in life. It's time to change your perspective. When you look out in the world, are you looking for something you want? Or are you looking for something you can do for God? What are your priorities? Is it playing on a computer, playing a video game? Watch, oh, I got this show. I just got this show. I got to sit down and binge watch this show. Why don't you binge read the Word of God? Why don't you get online, get some good preaching, and binge watch some sermons? Just watch one after another, after another, after another. Figure it out. Grow in doctrine. Grow in the power and the Spirit of God. It's up to you, Christian. It's your choice. If you reject what God has said, you will not have power on your life. You'll be weak. You'll be under attack by the devil. And how can you defend yourself if you don't know how to use your sword? For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. If you'll take heed unto these things, you have nothing to be afraid of. You don't have to worry about a snake biting you or getting in a car wreck 
Because God is bigger than the snake or the car or anything else. He will protect and preserve you. He says He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Christian, do you have a sound mind today? Are you sober? Do you love your brother? Do you love the, the other Christians in this church? Do you have the spirit of power on your life? Take heed to these simple things, and I promise you, you will. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this church. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we leave from here to just be in your spirit. Lord, I pray you would help us to, to get right in our lives and get closer to you. Help us to be willing to sacrifice the things that don't really matter. Help us be willing to grow in the spirit. Lord, I love the families in this church. I pray that you would help them to grow spiritually and protect them. Lord, give us the wisdom that we need to grow stronger in your power. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the time you've given us this morning. I, hope you, I just pray that you would help us apply these things.